We continue with our reading through the Gospel of Mark with chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. Again, listen for the word of the Lord. And I feel like I'm incredibly loud up here. Do you all feel like I'm too loud? Um, maybe it's just a little bit. You can turn me down. Herod Antipas, the king, soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That is why he can do such miracles. Others said, he's the prophet Elijah. Still others said, he's a prophet like the other great prophets of the past. When Herod heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has come back from the dead. Full of life in the spirit, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I hope you're enjoying our journey through the Gospel of Mark. Our children are also going through the Gospel of Mark in their Adventure Bible series. And so if you see some of the children, you can ask them what they're learning in Sunday school and uh, if they're enjoying the Gospel of Mark. Um, it's remarkable or mark your Bible. They're using some of those words to help them remember this, uh, this Gospel and it take, become real for them. But uh, I'm not saying that they might not bring up some difficult questions uh, because Mark does throw us a curveball now and then. And sometimes you may find them asking questions. Maybe you are even asking questions about what is happening, wondering, how, wondering what's going on there. Maybe you've even found yourself caught up in confusion or doubt or disbelief. And if that's what happens, good. Because Mark didn't write for all of those people that had religion all figured out. He wrote for those who were broken, for those who were questioning and needing to hear about who Jesus was and what they could, what Jesus could do to make a difference in their life. At this point in Mark's gospel, we see a lot of doubt swarming about who Jesus is and what he is doing throughout Galilee and Judea. Last week, you'll remember, Reverend Cam McConnell preached about a man who was overcome with so much doubt and fear that he told Jesus his name was Legion, for the voices in his head were many. And Jesus had the power to cast out that doubt and that fear and the shame or whatever it was that was overwhelming this man. And he cleansed this man's soul. And the man went raving about everything that Jesus had done for him. Well, now we are here in chapter six and we see Jesus returning to his hometown. And instead of seeing a parade with palm branches and streamers and ticker tape, we hear people heckling him and doubting him even more. Maybe even throwing tomatoes or shoes or whatever they did back then, throwing stuff at his preaching. We hear a line about how prophets are never welcomed in their own town and it seems almost too easy to dismiss. And I think we, we miss the irony and the weight of this encounter. The small towns that I know were always ready to claim anyone who had gathered any popularity or fame that they had lived in their town, even if it was for a brief time. I remember back in the 90s when we would drive through Stillwater, Oklahoma, there was a sign that said Garth Brooks lived here, even just for that period of college. And I, I remember when Shannon Miller came home from the Olympics and she had her five gold medals and Edmund was so excited to welcome her home that I, I, I feel like they gave her a car even though she was 15, so she couldn't drive it yet. Or, and then later on, they, they named a highway, a parkway after her. So, so I would expect a, a small town to be excited and say, oh Jesus, we're so glad that you're here. Now you can heal your own people because you're one of us. You can heal us and do what you've been doing for those others come and save us. Don't you want to do it for us, the ones who raised you, the ones who kept you safe? 
or maybe you can expect them to be putting on pressure to on their young his younger younger brothers and sisters you know how those younger brothers and sisters are expected to do the same as their older brother or their older sister and maybe they we're trying to put pressure on them. Well, can't you cast out demons just like Jesus does? Can't you lay hands on us and heal us? Everywhere Jesus went, there were crowds of people that were just rushing up to him, pushing him to the edges, everyone wanting to touch him to be healed. But he comes home and he gets such a different welcome. This crowd says, The stories about what you've been doing are so unbelievable that they literally don't believe that he can do them. And Jesus literally could not do any miracles among them because of their unbelief. I want you to think about that for a second. Imagine Jesus standing in a crowd and not being able to do a miracle because they wouldn't believe in it. Maybe you felt like that from time to time, trying to tell someone something that would make their life so much better or trying to explain the truth about something to someone and they just will not believe you. Or they, they won't even listen or, or try to understand you. And so what does Jesus do in this situation? He turns away and he goes to where the healings will be seen as miracles. And I think here we can describe a miracle as something that is an unbelievable act, which draws people to believe in Jesus and therefore believe in the glory and mystery and grace and love of God. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he sends them out two by two so that they can spread the truth about Jesus. Who, this Jesus who is able to heal and cast out demons and they're sent to do those things in his name. Sending them in pairs was very important for their time. They didn't have Twitter or Google or Snopes or anything else where we can go and find out information immediately or test things to find out if they're true. When someone would tell them about something they had witnessed, they would get, they would need a second eye witness with them to confirm the story. The crazy part I think to me is that we haven't really seen the disciples do anything that would make them worthy or um, good candidates to send out to tell the truth about Jesus, people that might be believable. What was Jesus thinking about sending this band of misfits out to tell the truth about what they had seen? Mark really isn't like the other gospels that um, build up this horrible picture of these um, these um, incapable disciples. But still, we wonder how old were they? What what um, equipped them to be the ones to carrying out the mission? Were they as young as some of our youth, teenagers still? Were they as young as some of our college students? Would you believe them if they came to you telling you that the Messiah had come? My sister has me hooked on this unbelievable new musical called Hamilton. Maybe, I don't know if any of you have heard about it or heard heard some of the music, but it tells the story of the life of Alexander Hamilton. And it's unlike any other musical you've ever heard before. And it's, it's based on a kind of lyrical rap. And um, the, the storyline is based on a biography of Alexander Hamilton from, by Ron Chernow. So if you're a, a political history buff, if you enjoy um, studying about political history, or if you enjoy rap, or if you enjoy musical theater, any, any of these widely um, unconnected groups of people, you might enjoy this musical. And uh, so you'll have to find a recording. but. 
I, I myself had a hard time following the plot, so I had to research a little bit about Hamilton's life. And I was shocked to learn about this man who had kind of come up from nothing and really at such an early age. I, I was amazed to hear how young he was when he was involved in the American Revolution and that and many of the stars of the revolution were just as young as him in their early 20s and even through the mid, their mid-20s during the American Revolution. And it, it, it just shocked me to think how young he was, even still as a secretary of the treasury, just defining the financial systems of our country. General Washington trusted him as his right-hand man. And here he was. What, what did he have to show for it? So with all of these several stars in, in our history coming towards the revolution, what was it that made it so powerful? Sure, they were a band of misfits, but they were starving for their own country. They were a group of people passionate about change and, and building something new, something amazing, something unbelievable a place where you could come to be a new man, as they put it in Hamilton. Maybe the disciples were a little bit like them, talented and passionate in their own ways, willing and hungry for God's new nation to come to life in their midst. Jesus is careful to send his disciples out with very strict instructions. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave. But if anyone refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. It almost reminds me of some poetry, the poetry of Swift, um, Taylor Swift, that is. Um, <laughs> the haters gonna hate, 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 hate. Baby, I'm just going to shake, 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 shake. I shake it off. I shake it off. I think I got some laughs there. I, I should have done it better to get more laughs. Um, but she says, just shake it off. And Jesus wants them to shake it off. Jesus wants them to get their feet dirty. He wants them to, he directly orders them to wear their sandals. And you heard they're only supposed to wear one, bring they're not supposed to bring a change of clothes. They're just wearing the same clothes. So can you imagine how smelly they might be? And so, so they're supposed to show up and, and they show up and th when they talk to these people, if the people don't believe, he doesn't say to force them or convince them or pressure them to receive the good news and be healed or else. Jesus just says, turn around shake it off. And I, I think there's an even deeper significance here too, that when they would be received, when they would be welcomed into, an, into a new home, a home of believers, they wouldn't have to shake off the dust from their feet. These strangers would welcome them in as guests in their home and they would wash their feet and invite them to, to stay in their home. So you see, these disciples were sent out not looking for people that they had to convince and, and completely change and, and, um, and force to believe in the gospel. But they were sent out looking for people who were open to seeing God doing a new thing in their lives. And it turned out that people weren't just open to seeing the kingdom of God, on their doorstep, literally, they were hungry. They were even starving to see these unbelievable acts of God. So I ask you here today, are you willing to see God do unbelievable things in your life? Are you hungry, even starving for it? So starving that you are, are willing to talk to strangers and hear about the unbelievable things that God is doing in their life that they have been witness to? 
who might God be calling you to welcome into your life? Or are you one of the misfits that God might be sending out to share the stories of what you have seen God do? Are you one to be sent to refresh and heal the souls of the brokenhearted people in our communities, in our churches, in our nation, throughout our world? My prayer for you is this. May this mystery of our unbelievable God continue to bring you joy and a desire to learn more as we continue through this gospel of Mark. Amen. As we close our service today, I invite you to prepare your feet to move. I'll invite you to stand up and um, sing the song, Guide Our Feet, a good old um, spiritual. And um, <clears throat> if there are some basses out there that want to sing that little bass line, you go right ahead. Let us stand and sing. <clears throat> 